If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me this morning to Ezekiel chapter 37? Ezekiel chapter 37. It has been an unusual week for me. Um, pastoring a church is not, uh, is not an easy thing ever, but there are some times that it is, more, it is more stressful and strenuous than others. This week, the warfare has been intense. It has been a difficult week for me spiritually, and, um, and so I have a message prepared, another message prepared that I, that I thought we were going to do today. But yesterday, the Lord began to, uh, I began to sense the Lord changing the direction. And so today I'm going to share, uh, I'm going to share a message that I preached a few weeks ago on a Sunday night in a different church. Um, and I felt like the Lord lead me in this direction. Now, if this, if this is a bomb, if this doesn't work, then I just miss God, okay? I don't want to blame this on the Lord. But this is the way I, I, I sense the Lord leading this morning. Um, I, I remember growing up, our pastors would sometimes say, you know, just have a burden this morning. And I didn't, I didn't know what that meant. Um, I think I understand now that sometimes uh, uh, the Lord will place upon the pastor the burdens of the people, the, the feelings, the, the, the situations that you're going through. Sometimes I feel it even as you experience it. And so this morning I want you to know that I am trying to bear the burden with you and that this morning I want to bring you a word of encouragement and hope. Um, so I, w- I wish you would prepare your hearts with me. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. 1 through 14, I'm reading from the NIV this morning. It says this, The hand of the Lord was, was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, Can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come uh, come upon you and cover you with skin. I will Put breath in you, and you will come to life, and then you will know that I am the Lord. So I, I prophesied as I was commanded, and I w- as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says Come, breath from the four winds, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Now I want you to pay attention to this our bones are dried up. And our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back from the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Father, I pray that you would add your anointing to the reading and the preaching and the hearing of your word. God, I pray that you would help us for the next few minutes that we just get honest with you. God, that we would let down the facade, we would let down the mask, and that we would be that we would just be laid bare before you, God, so that you could work in our lives, you can move and you can change inside of us. God, we are honest enough to tell you today that we need you. I need you. And God, I pray that you would help us to hear your voice this morning, that that in place of, of a man speaking words, that we'd hear your voice speaking life. 
In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. This passage that I just read was a, a vision that was given to God by Ezekiel almost 2,500 years ago. And unlike some of the, the Old Testament prophecies and visions, this one was interpreted by God right on the spot. He told us exactly what he was talking about. He told Ezekiel that it was a picture. This vision of dry bones, the valley of dry bones, was a picture of his people Israel. It was an indication of their spiritual condition. It was a representation of how far they had fallen from their status as God's blessed and chosen people to now being strangers and pilgrims and exiles in a foreign land. And while it does have that historical uh, fulfillment, it does mean that. I also believe that it has an application for us today. I believe that this is a picture of the American church. And if I can be honest with you, uh, the, the, I believe the Lord began to stir in me yesterday that this is also a picture of this church as well. Now listen, I, I think we have the best, most mature, most obedient people that I think I've ever seen in a church. You know I love you. You know I'm excited about the kind of church that you are. I, I believe that you do the best you can possibly do, that you hear the word and you try your best to live it and to put it into practice. I believe that. So what, what I'm saying to you today is, is not in, in no way a condemnation, but as your pastor, I am concerned. I am concerned about the weight of what I feel that you're carrying. I'm concerned when I see us drag in here every week and then drag out just like we came in. Uh, too often, recently, our services have been dry and lifeless. And I am concerned as your pastor. I'm concerned for you. And I'm concerned that when people come in and they need a touch from God, they come in searching for something. I'm concerned whether or not there's enough of a demonstration of the joy and the peace and the power and the presence of God that their lives can be changed. I know a lot of you have been through a difficult season. I know a lot of you are going through a dry season, a tough time. And so today I want to bring you some hope. I want to bring you some hope. God asked Ezekiel a question that I want to ask you today. He said, can these bones live again? Can these bones live again? I'm posing the same question to you today. Can the lukewarm and the ice cold among us be brought back to red hot spiritual life that Jesus has called us to? Listen, I want to answer my own question right now before we, before we even begin good. I want to tell you today that the answer is yes. Can these bones live again? The answer is yes. Yes, they can live again. Because you see, it is, it is God's specialty to resurrect dead things. It is His pleasure to give beauty for ashes. And, and so today, I believe that God wants to resurrect the things that are in us that are dead. The things that, that have become dry bones in our lives. And I think He wants to show us some hope today. So let's dive in and, and let's see what those things are. That, that sap the strength from our lives, that dry us out. And then let's see what God is going to do about it today. Is everybody okay? First of all, there are too many of us that are dried out from difficulty. We're dried out from difficulty. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but life is difficult. Life's tough. Life, life gets difficult hard. This thing we call living will take a toll on you. You see, life moves at a pace that has never before been seen in the history of mankind. We, we call it the technology age. And, 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 and I think it was supposed to make life easier and more convenient, as I understand it. It was supposed to make life easier and more convenient. But from what I, I can tell, all it's done is accelerate the pace of the decisions and the activities that are going on in our lives. Now, all it has done is make us accessible to everybody, everywhere, all the time. The, the line between our, our personal lives and our jobs has gotten so blurred to the point that it's practically non-existent. We're always on, always connected, always accessible to everybody. 
We've gotten our kids so involved in so many sports and lessons and activities, it's like a part-time job for them after school. And all of this activity and all of this connectedness, it stretches us to the emotional breaking point, to when we actually do have a crisis in our lives, when we actually do have a tragedy, we actually do have a difficult situation that arises in our lives, as all of us will from time to time, it throws us into this, into this downward spiral because we can't handle one more thing. See, life was not meant, humans were not created to live like we're living. This, this life will drain us if we're not careful. And we haven't even talked about people yet. I, I know this is not a very pastoral thing to say, but as I read the sign on the way in today, it says that we can be real. Um, so I, I just want to put this out there. People are crazy. People are crazy. Uh, I, I mean, I guess to some extent, people have always been crazy. Like, I guess there were crazy people in Bible days and, you know, crazy people in the 1800s. But, I, you know, I didn't live there. But it seems to me like people are getting crazier. And now they have tools with social media to amplify their particular brand of crazy, not just in their community, but to, like, everybody in the world. So now when you're crazy, you get to tell everybody you're crazy. I mean, used to we have a crazy neighbor and he'll come out and howl at the moon in our yard. That's one thing. But when you howl at the moon in front of everybody in the world, that's a whole other level of crazy. I thought I'd get an amen or something up in there. People are exhausting. They're exhausting. Jesus said this, In this world, you will have trouble. Listen, trouble is not optional. It, you, don't, you don't get to choose life with or without trouble. Jesus said, you, go, you are going to have trouble. We live in a fallen world. We are still living in a world that's cursed by sin. We will have trouble. And some of it's going to be from our own doing because we make a mess of stuff sometimes, don't we? But some of it, well, it, it, it comes right out of the blue. It just, it just happens in an instant, and through no fault of our own, we'll find ourselves in a crisis that will just drain the very life out of us. And if two or three of those situations hit you, one right after the other, after the other, or if they last too long, or if you get some of those friends like Job had that tell you everything that's happening to you is your fault, then it gets easy to find yourself lying on your back in a valley that you're not sure you can get out of. And what happens is those troubles and those trials and those difficulties can cause you to lose hope. When you go from battle to battle and from, and from crisis to crisis, you go from one problem to another problem, one crazy person to another crazy person in your life, it drains the hope out of you. That's what God said happened to the nation of Israel. They were hopeless and it had dried up their bones. When you go through these situations that seem hopeless, what, what almost always happens is that it causes you to lose touch with your relationship with Jesus. And you, and you stop praying. And you stop reading the Word. And you stop worshiping. And you stop attending church. Or if you do attend church, you're doing it out of religious ritual and routine. You're just checking it off the box. You're just coming in because it's what you do. And you come in and you go out the exact same way, never having engaged God in the way that Jordan was talking about today. And when you do that, hope drains from your body and from your bones until you're left parched and dry. There was a time about 12 years ago or so, I don't remember exactly when it was, but there was a time over a decade ago when I found myself in that very same valley. I had, uh, the circumstances of my life had just gotten to the point that I had become discouraged and disillusioned. I didn't, things were going on in my life that I didn't understand. And it was as if all the life had drained out of me. Our former pastor, uh, his sister was a, um, a nurse, and she lived in Savannah, so she would visit from time to time, and she visited during that period of time, and she told my pastor, she said, something's wrong with John. Something's wrong with him. Look at him. He's gray. 
He's, his, 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 look at his face. There's no color in his face. Something is going on with him. That's what it looks like when you have no hope. That's what it looks like when your bones are dry. I was the music pastor here for 15 years before I became the, the lead pastor a few years ago. And, and I remember standing on this platform on a Sunday morning leading worship to a God I wasn't even sure I still believed in. My mind was reeling because I couldn't, I couldn't come to terms with what I was going through. And I knew that if, if that was truly the way it was in my life, if I truly had lost faith in God, then, then my whole life had been a lie. And that not only had I lived a lie, but I had led other people into living a lie. And it was a, it was a, a weight and a pressure like I've never had in my life. And it was a, it was a lonely place. It was a dark place. It was a miserable place. It was a hopeless place. So I did the only thing that I knew to do because sometimes when you're, when you're in that valley of decision, the, the right or wrong, what you need to do is just make a decision because being in that place where you don't know will kill you. And so I decided I was just going to make a decision one way or the other. And so I, I did the only thing I knew how to do. I went back to the foundation of what I believed. I went back to the origins of this world that I could see with my own eyes. And I said, well, where did this stuff come from? And that led me to an intelligent creator. Because this is not accidental. And that, that understanding of, of an intelligent creator led me to God. And that led me to original sin, which led me to Jesus. And I finally realized that although I still felt hopeless at the moment, that the only hope I had was in Jesus. And so, although I didn't still, I still didn't like what was going on, that I still was angry, that I still was confused, and I still didn't understand, I, I, st I just still didn't know why life had to be so difficult, and, and I, just, I knew in that moment that although those things had not changed, my circumstance had not changed, I knew God was real, and I knew God was wise, and I knew God was good. And I knew that if I had any hope whatsoever in this life, it was in my relationship with Jesus. If you find yourself in that situation this morning, then let me tell you, reconnect yourself with Jesus. If, if you have never connected yourself with Him, connect with Him today. Surrender your life to Him today. If you have surrendered your life, but you found yourself in this valley like I did, then reconnect yourself with Jesus today. I know you don't feel like praying. Pray anyway. I know you don't feel like reading the Word. Read it anyway. I know you don't feel like worshiping. Worship anyway. Go to church anyway. Serve God and serve others anyway. You do the things that you know you should do because when you do those things, you're connecting yourself with Jesus. And when you connect with Jesus, you are connecting with hope. It's, it's not that our hope is around Jesus or related to Jesus. Our hope is Jesus. It is Jesus. So if you're dried out from difficulty today, you may be asking yourself, can these bones live again? The answer is yes, they can. Connect yourself back to Jesus today. Why are, why are people, why are so many people in the American church, and many people in this church, why are we living with such dry bones? I think some of it is that we have been dried out from difficulty. I think still others, and this is not everybody, but I think still others are sapped from sin. We're sapped from sin. We have a sin problem in the American church. We have a sin problem in the American church. Now, I did not say we have a sin problem in America I'm not talking about the people who don't know Jesus. Of course they're sinning. They're still in sin. They haven't been saved. Sinners sin. That's what they do. 
at why in the world we stand in our pulpits and we fuss at sinners for sinning, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand that concept. We need to be fussing at the people who know better, the people who have been delivered from sin, the people that the Word says the power of sin has been broken over their lives, and then we turn around and entangle ourselves right back in the stuff that God set us free from. That's the problem that we have in the American church. We have a sin problem inside the walls. As believers, God has called us to be salt and light. He's called us to be different and to make a difference. He's called us to carry His great name and the gospel of Jesus Christ into a world that doesn't know Him. But when you look at the American church, what you see on the inside is not that much different from what you see on the outside. According to those who do research and study such things, there is now no discernible difference in the lifestyles and the attitudes of those who are claimed to know Jesus and are inside the church versus those who do not know Him. People inside the church are just as likely to lie and cheat and steal and commit adultery and watch pornography as the average unchurched person is. There is statistically no difference. They're just as likely to gossip and slander and complain and groan and cause trouble as those who don't know Jesus. And if you've been in the church as long as I've been in the church, then you're probably suspecting the people inside are worse about it than the people outside. In other words, despite the fact that we claim that we know Jesus as the way and the truth and the life, the reality is too many of us are dead. And although Jesus died for our sins and set us free, for some reason or other, we have chosen to entangle ourselves in the world all over again. And we forget that Romans tells us that the wages of sin is still death, whether you're a saint or a sinner. That something dies when sin is present. And so sin has sapped the strength from our bones. And we lie flat of our back in a valley. So what do we do about it? Well, the answer is actually quite simple. It is very, very easy to say. We repent of our sins. That's the only solution to sin, and it's the only one that's ever been. We repent of our sins. Now, that's not a word that we hear much anymore. It's not a word that we talk about. I want to tell you something that might shock you. You can use your Strong's Concordance. You can do your Bible app. You can do whatever you want to. But you will be hard-pressed to find any verse in the Bible where the word ask and the word forgiveness are found together. You see, we tell people, oh, just ask forgiveness and you'll be okay. The problem is that is not a biblical concept. Repentance is what God requires. Repentance. The word literally means to change your mind or to rethink. It means you consider your sinful ways in the light of the holiness of God and you change your mind and your actions accordingly. Not that we go and find us a doctrine that allows us to live however we want to live and, and, and we change the doctrine and the eternal word of God to fit our lifestyle. Repentance means we set that as the foundation of our lives and then we build our lives according to what it says and not the other way around. Repentance is where that happens. Now there's an element of godly sorrow involved. You should be sorry for your sin because it damages the relationship that we have with God. It saps the strength from our bones. We should be sorry about it. But God doesn't need us to apologize. He needs us to change. Let me demonstrate it to you this way. I, 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 I used this a few years ago, but I, I want to remind you of it. A few years ago, they came out with these, with these things, these um, scent boosters. Have you all seen these things? It's right out of the pits of hell right there, them things. Them things are like $10 a bottle or something crazy. Hurts my feelings to buy them. Valerie will not let me in the house with groceries unless I buy them things because she loves her clothes to smell good. So, so we buy those things, all right? And what you do is, you, in, in case you have not fallen victim to this conspiracy here, 
you throw those things in the water. It boosts the scent. It makes them smell good. You just toss them in there. And it really does make the clothes smell good. But there is a difference in these things and in detergent. Detergent gets down into your clothes. And see, there's detergent now. Detergent gets down in there and it helps remove the dirt and remove the stains. It makes your clothes clean. And because they're clean, they smell good. What happens if you just throw the little downy pellets in there and you don't put the detergent in there? Well, you might smell clean, but you ain't clean. You might appear to have washed your clothes, but the stains and the dirt are still there. You see where I'm going? We got too many people who want to feel better about their sin, who want the benefits of forgiveness without the pain of repentance. You see, forgiveness is what God gives you. It's what He extends to you when you repent. But without the repentance of your sin, you've got no grounds to ask God for forgiveness because you haven't been made clean. The problem in the church is we got too many people, they feel convicted about the way they're living or the things that they're doing, but all they want is to feel better about it. And so they might come to an altar or they might just bow their heads in their seat and they might say, forgive me, Lord, but they've got no intentions of changing their behavior. They never express any godly sorrow for their actions. They don't change the way they think about it. They simply want to feel better about it. Listen, God is a gracious and loving and compassionate God. But He only offers forgiveness to those who repent of their sin and commit to turning from them. Why are so many people in the church dried up and lying in the valley? Because some of them have had their strength sapped from sins that they've asked forgiveness for, but they never repented of. They want the effects of forgiveness without the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. And in case you haven't noticed, what can wash away my sin? The answer is still nothing but the blood of Jesus. You can throw those little pellets in all you want to. And you'll get by with it for a little while. But if you don't ever wash them and make them clean, then eventually the stench of the dirt and the grime will overpower the fresh scent. We must repent. You say, John, I don't know about all this now. I, that's not a, I, don't hear, I don't hear all the big preachers talking. I don't hear all the smart preachers talking about repentance. John the Baptist was a voice crying in the wilderness and he said repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand Jesus came behind him and picked up the same message Jesus' message to the world that he lived in was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand Jesus called the twelve disciples to him and he sent them out in pairs to the villages and cities around them and he said here's your message repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand he called 70 more people he gave them the same message he said you go tell them repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand Peter on the day of Pentecost the first message that was preached with the power of the Holy Spirit as he launched the church the first message Peter preached was repent Peter and John in Acts chapter 3 preached the same message. They looked at the people and they said, Repent. Paul in Acts chapter 17 stood before the Athenians on the hill and he said, God used to wink at your sinful ignorance, but now he calls all men everywhere to repent. The word of the Lord to the American church, the word of the Lord to Covenant Life Church, the word of the Lord to those who are in the valley of dry bones is one word. It's repent. Repent. The cry of a repentant heart is not, Lord, make me look better, or Lord, make me feel better. The cry of a repentant heart is, Lord, make me clean. Lord, make me more like you. So we cry out to the Lord, Lord, forgive us of our prayerlessness. 
Forgive us, God. We repent for not knowing your word. We repent for, for our religious spirits. We repent for having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. We repent for the way we've talked about each other. We repent for the way we've divided your body by race and by class and by money and by denomination and by personal preference. We admit that sometimes we're wrong. We confess that we are often arrogant and prideful. We, we Lord, we want to rethink everything. We want to repent about everything. We want to take every thought captive and bring it under the subjection to your will and to your word. God, we want to be more like you. Lord, we don't just want to look clean. We don't want to smell clean. We don't want to appear clean. God, we want to be clean. We must repent. We must repent. Can these bones live again? Yes, if we'll repent. Now here's the last thing. In verses 7 and 8, the bones came back together. The bones rattled back together. The body came together and they stood up, but it was not enough. It was not enough to be the mighty army that God was intending it to be. Something was missing. Something was missing. What else was missing so that the bones could live again? What was missing is the same thing that's missing in most of our American churches today. The same thing that unfortunately is missing too much in our church as well. You see, it's good. It's good for those who are dried out from difficulty to find their hope in Jesus. And it's good for those who, who have their strength sapped from sin to come and be cleansed by repentance. But it's not enough to be empty of the bad stuff. What sets believers apart from everybody else, what sets a believer apart from a good moral person is not what we're empty of, it's what we're full of. In this vision God showed Ezekiel, he showed them that these folks had been put back together, but they were missing the element of life. God said in verse 14, I will put my spirit in you, and you will live again. Listen, it doesn't matter how much hope you have. It doesn't matter how clean you are. If you're not full of the Holy Spirit, then you will never be what God intends for you to be. The only way for you to be effective for God, the only way we can be the mighty army that God wants to raise up in these last days is for us to stop walking in the Spirit, in the flesh, and start walking in the Spirit. Look, I know we get weary in well-doing. I know we do. I know life gets tough. And I know we lose our focus and we lose our vision and we lose our drive. But it is time for us at Covenant Life to cry out for the breath of God to blow across us again. It's time for us to cry out for revival again. It's time for us to cry out like they said in Acts chapter 4 and verse 17. It's time for us for times of refreshing to come again. This is a Pentecostal church. We believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit. And it's time for the Spirit-filled saints of God in this church to stir up the gifts that are in them. It's time for those of us who are not filled with the Spirit yet or who have not had that experience on a regular basis. It's time for us to ask. It's time for us to seek it's time for us to knock. It's time for us to do as the old, the, the old timers say, to grab hold of the horns of the altar and not let go until God gives us the power of His Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if a good father knows how to give good gifts to his children, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And it's time for us on this day of Pentecost to cry out to, to, to God for another upper room experience. It's time for us to lift our voices and cry out, Lord, we need you to blow upon us again. We need your rain to fall on us again. Jesus said out of our bellies would flow rivers of living water. If you have a river of living water flowing from your belly, you should never have a reason for your bones to be dry. So we have to cry out to him, Lord, let it flow. Renew us, Lord. Revive us, Lord. Fill us afresh 
and anew. Equip us for the battle, Lord. Lord, help us prepare our hearts to receive more of you. Let us make room for you, God. We, we have placed our hope in you. God, we've repented of our sin. And now, Lord, fill every space in our lives, Lord, with your spirit. Place your breath in us so that we can, that we can praise you. Place your spirit in us that we can serve you. Place your heart in us that we can love people like you love people. Place your eyes in us so we can see people the way you see them. Lord, give compassion to our hands and, and, and courage to our feet. Lord, make our faces like flint that we can boldly stand and proclaim the word of the Lord without compromise. Lord, do for us what you said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we can be witnesses for you in Bremen and in Tallapoosa and in the state of Georgia and everywhere else in the world that you might call us. Lord, revive us again. Can these bones live? Yes, these bones can live. Yes, your bones can live. Your bones can live. You say, John, it scares me when all this Pentecostal talk, I don't know if I'm, if I'm, if I'm up for that. Well, do you want to keep living in the valley of dry bones? We have a choice to make. We have to sell out. We have to go in. We have to go all in. If you keep straddling the fence, of course you're going to live a life of pain. We have to go all in. I was raised in a Pentecostal church, born in a Pentecostal church most of my life. For a few years we left and went to a Baptist church. When we came back to a Pentecostal church, it scared me to death. I don't know what in the world these people are doing. And I went down to the altar, some, some district meeting, you know, you know how it was back then. It, we went to church all the time. We looked for, we made excuses to go to church. We went to church, Friday night we went to church. And this, this preacher said, everybody who has not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you need to come down here. So I went, because I hadn't. The man said, come, I came. He said, what do, you, what do you need? I said, I need baptism of the Holy Spirit. He said, everybody needs him. Do you want him? And I said, hang on a minute. Think about that. The answer was no, I didn't. I wasn't willing to give up yet. I wasn't willing to surrender. Because when you, when you invite the presence of God, the power of God into your life, you, what you're doing is admitting that you are no longer in charge of you. And I wasn't sure I wanted to do that because I, I, am, a, I am a bashful person by nature. I don't like to be embarrassed. I don't like to be pointed out. I like to blend in with the crowd and leave with the crowd. I don't want to stand out. And, you know, I grew up in old-time church, so, you know, we wallering and crawling on the walls and stuff and spinning and, you know, bouncing off each other. And I'm like, Lord Jesus, I don't know if I want any of that or not. I was 22 years old, 22, when I finally got desperate enough. When I finally said, God, I don't, I, I, I don't care. I don't care. If you're going to embarrass me, embarrass me. I got to flop like a fish. I, let, let's start flopping. You know, let's, whatever it is. I'll, but I can't live like this anymore. I can't live the way I've been living anymore. What I want from you, I want bad enough to give up everything else in my life, including my dignity and my pride. And if you're not there, that's okay. It ain't a sin. But you got to decide where you want to head. You got to decide where you want to go in your life. You got to decide what you want God to do with you, whether you want to fulfill His destiny or not. And I'm just telling you, maybe I've been remiss as a pastor of this church and not saying this more, but we have got to be filled with the Holy Spirit and with power in our lives. My pastor used to say this all the time. He say, "Look, you do not have to be filled with the Holy with baptizing the Holy Spirit to go to heaven. But if you plan to live for very much longer between now and then, then you better be going after God and getting everything he's got for you." I want you to stand with me today.